Recording, we're live. Wake up, wake up. Okay, I'm good. What are you drinking? Uh, oh, just, Prime. I, oh. Yeah, no, no relation. Just no. <laughs> never. Ha- yeah, he's not sponsoring you. <laughs> hey, Logan yeah. Paul, we sure do like Prime. Yeah, no, no, I saw it was on sale, and I'm like, oh, I like energy. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I figured I'd try it. I like trying all the different energy drinks, but yeah, it's, I mean the macros look good on it, so you know tastes what decent. I've, you know what? Didn't I've knock my socks off to, though. Uh, I've never been able to get over Cameron Echelon. I really, yeah. I hey, listen, they're not sponsoring this. But I'm just saying Echelon. If you want to send me an extra case, I'm not going to say no. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That I really enjoyed that. It was really tasty. It's almost a religious experience because, <laughs> uh, like, I didn't think energy drinks. Are supposed are supposed to make you feel like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I ended up going back to uh, Eglin Air Force Base to do some to do some work, and I stopped by the PX, and they pretty much the only way you're getting Echelon is on a military base or at like a GNC. Oh. Uh, so I picked one up and I had it, and I drank half of it, and I had to like put it down. <laughs> That's saying something for you, man. Yeah, you're like in your your peak physical condition, man. You're like a hard charger. Yeah, no, that the echelons. I do enjoy them because it. That's one of those energy drinks that's just break in case of emergency. <laughs> yeah, yep, you gotta yep. watch out. They'll get you. Uh, today, folks, if you have read the title of the episode, which you should have, don't just if you click, can read. Don't just arbitrarily <laughs> click on an episode. Okay, you never know what you're gonna get. We can talk about anything, but in this yeah. one. We're talking about we're just, it's kind of a wrap up or kind of a, a, a once over the world. We're going to go through major conflicts, I guess, major American involved conflicts, because there's tons of conflicts. Obviously, conflict has been the one constant in human since Cain killed Abel. We've been killing each other, as I'm since fond of saying. Is that your cat? Is that that, your can you hear him? Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty. I think it's you need awesome. to quiet down, man. You need to quiet down. <laughs> But you're not paying attention to me. <laughs> there he is. Yeah, he's not being cool today. Oh, uh, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. We'll keep trucking along. That's right. So today, everyone, Cameron and I are going to go through some major American conflicts from just before the beginnings of the United States all the way up through uh, the ones that we have been involved in. Most of the ones we've been involved. I'm sure that we've been involved in a lot of secret wars that we don't know about that are still classified. But... And we're going to try to give you and talk about why uh, the the best representation of each one, what pop culture, uh, piece of pop culture best represents each individual conflict and the reasons why we think so. So that's yeah. today's episode, folks. You can tell us if you agree with our list or if not. And then we'll talk about some honorable mentions uh, and some other, whether it be a, a smaller conflict or another historical incident that we think, oh yeah, that has a great representation and here's why so great opening izzy yeah. but i don't want to i don't want to waste any time let's go into it let's let's go right into it starting with the french and indian war yeah this is an interesting one cam because it's we're not technically a nation yet right? we're not the united no, states yeah. we're still this land yeah this land was our land and it was their land and then it became our land because we took it from them and they didn't yes. you know it, uh but uh, it was the Indian land for a really long time. America, North America, uh, has been a land of conflict since the very beginning. Not the very beginning. I know that, you know, they had the Mayflower, the Pilgrims came over. There were some good times, man. We had some good times. But then <laughs> good times. national interests take over French, France and England, I think. They yep. are both vying for territory. And then the Indian tribes and conglomerations of Indian tribes, they, they pick their sides. And so, uh, so French and Indian war, that was that. And then I, I think it, did it lead to American independence or, uh, or like it kind of precipitated it? Cause I feel like, I feel like history, at least American history, it's just lulls between conflicts that yeah, are just that the of seeds of which the seeds of which are planted before in the previous conflict, you know, like yeah. World War one. That's the seeds were planted for World War II in World War One and the aftermath, you know. I mean, I, I could see so 
because in the French and Indian War, so we have that 1754 to 1763, mm-hmm. uh, so seven years, mm-hmm. um, a little bit longer than seven years, was the theater of the Seven Years' War. Okay, so basically we had North American colonies, uh, British Empire, which was us, you know? That's yeah. who we came over. That's yep. where we came from, yep. yep. Uh, and then versus the French with various Native American tribes split between loyalties right so different tribes are attached to different things um so basically i think you know great britain ended up pretty much taking taking the cake and then which ultimately led to the rebellion against britain for the settlers from the colonies to Mm -hmm. now which became america um so yeah i think you know the french and indian war ranger roots the only reason you know i'm very i'm even familiar with this war is because rangers the lineage that we were taught when we were in goes all the way back to the french and indian war but i think i believe off the top of my head was benjamin churchill let's see benjamin churchill on the google machine was an american military officer and he was in the french and indian war yes okay Okay. cool all right (laughs) nice i remember see from a and then he was also an uh, outbreak. Let's see. Oh, because actually we go back before that to the King Philip's War. Um, oh, Even never before mind. Before the French and Indian War? Yeah, during the French and Indian Church participated in asymmetric warfare against the French and their indigenous allies. He led troops to raid French colonies of Arcadia during the King William's War and Queen Anne's War, straightening his military career as rank captain. Um, so anyways... Never mind, he died in 1718. This was before. This is the King, <laughs> King Philip's War. Anyways, people. Well, um, hey, let's uh, let's get to our pick for the best encapsulation for the French and Indian War, which you probably can guess, folks, because there's not too many movies yeah, there's not a lot. involving the French and Indian War, and three of them are basically the same the same one. But uh, we chose the Michael Mann movie Last of the Mohicans. Absolutely. For good reason. Yes. Oh my God. What a, what an amazing film. Uh, great because it, so it, it gives the great context, right? It's a personal story, right? It's basically a love story between, yep. uh, Daniel day Lewis and Madeline Stowe, uh, their characters, but it's set against the backdrop of the French and Indian war. Yeah. And, it's uh, kind of going on in the background. Yeah. It gives just a great in the middle of it. Yeah. They're just, yeah, they're just, they're just in the middle of it. Uh, and, and, but, and it's also kind of like a, it's a bit of a melancholy or a sad tale because the last of the Mohicans, it's actually not Daniel Day Lewis. He is a, he's a white kid who was, uh, his family was killed and then he was raised by these Mohawk guys. And they're basically the last two. It's a father and a son. Yeah. You know? And so, their bloodline. yeah. And so there's a bit of a commentary of, of the, you know, the slow expansion of European nations coming into the American lands and and just kind of the slow encroachment of of uh, of Indian nations that you know partnering with them moving away and file but you know and then it's like it's kind of just like like I know how the I know popular culture is like we killed them we just brought in a bunch of you know a chicken pock infested blanket to just yeah, wipe we them just all out use just the stood birth in a of line warfare. and march slowly across the plane just shooting Indians everywhere we. But it's it's just kind of what happens when two cultures meet one another or multiple cultures come together. Inevitably, they are influenced by one another. There's some conflict, and eventually, you know, there's an equilibrium that's established. So I feel like Last of the Mohicans is is a is a good kind of little snapshot of that of that time period. You know, when these world powers French France French and India uh, French France and England. And then by their proxy, you know, uh, of Indian tribes who choose their loyalties and say, hey, we're going to go with these guys and we're going to go with them. So, you yeah. know, when did you like, when did you first see Last of the Mohicans, Cam? Ooh, OK. I actually saw Last of the Mohicans when I was in Ranger Regiment. Because, really? Yeah, oh, wow, it was cool. it was a little later in life um, because there's a few movies, obviously, that people obsess over mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, The Last of the Mohicans is one of those movies. I don't know that holds a very high high rank within the military for like, you know, pieces of films that or you know, a film that you should watch if you're in the military. Mm-hmm. Um because A, 
the soundtrack is legendary. Oh yeah. yeah. I think I've told you this story where we had the, uh, we had like a, a family day or something where like all the kids were running around. I think this was like in 2017 or 18. And it was like, F- I think it was an FRG event, but okay. it was one of those family ready days yeah. that everyone's going to be here. Yeah. You're voluntold to, yeah. You're like, everyone's going to be here even if you don't want to be, and yeah. it's, you're going to have fun. So, <laughs> So I remember they had like little, like little, uh, on the ranger, there used to be this ginormous, like green grass lot. Uh, and that's where like the ranger memorial is. If you literally Google maps, uh, Fort Lewis, I guarantee you, you will be able to find second ranger battalion because there is like a, a hundred foot two diamond or ranger scroll. What was it? Is it a ring? I think it's a ranger scroll that's on the ground that you can like oh, see, see from, from orbit. The- yeah, literally. I mean, that'd be funny if I could pull that up. Let's see <laughs> if I can. But uh, yeah, we have this giant uh, green grass like lot next to it. And it was like a bunch of stations set up for all the kids and stuff. And they had a yeah. they had a tomahawk throwing station uh, that literally the entire time would just uh <laughs> on loop for like six hours straight to just play the last of the Mohican <laughs> And I just remember listening to it all day. And we had a Sergeant Major at the Command Sergeant Major of the time at 275. Uh, and he was loving it. Uh, so that's kind of like if you, you know, if you were there, you're like, yeah, I, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when was your first experience with that movie? Man, it's one of those... I, I first saw this movie in Colorado Springs. I remember it was playing... It was one of those things that was playing in the background at, yeah. a, at a different... And, and, and you kind of intend to just have it be in the background, but then, like, you end up sitting down... Everybody ended up sitting down and watching it. Because it's yeah. one of those movies that you can just, it's just so watchable. And then since then I've, I've sat down and actually fully given it my attention. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I love it. Cause I, I remember being surprised when the, uh, at the end, I thought the sun, you know, the sun is the one that carries on and lives his life. And the, and the Indian son, the Mohawk Indian son, he actually gets killed <laughs> by Mogwai. Yeah. Um, and then the father's like, just like, He's just like, oh, well, all right. Once we were here, you know. <laughs> That's but, rough, uh, dude. Yeah, Daniel Day Lewis is all. I've, I've always enjoyed his his performances, you know. And Wes Studi, I met him once. Yes, came, came I met him once. Of yeah. So uh, it's always very important to mention that. But Last of the Mohicans, yeah, man. French and Indian War, uh, great, great little encapsulation. It's always good when they. Well, you got to do this. It's. It's a, it's a, the, the, the context is too big, right? Unless you're doing some sort of documentary or some sort of epic film or, or miniseries about the entirety of it, you got to make it personal. So they kind of put these yeah. two people in the midst of the story and Michael Mann, I've always loved his, his direction. So yeah, it's really cool. All right. Oh, you got it. <laughs> All right. So right here. Zoom, All right. Zoom, you gotta, zoom, this is why zoom, you got to watch the YouTube versions folks. Cause we're looking at, Fort Lewis right now, but Cameron brought it up on the Google second ranger. <laughs> That's huge, man. Is that, a, it's huge. is that grass or is that colored grass or is that turf or something? This is like, uh, actually this orange part. So you have, this is all, uh, bricks. Okay. And then okay. this orange part is colored bricks, but each one has the name of the, a donor that helped donate uh, to create this memorial. Right on. Okay. So, so yeah, <laughs> this is that green, that green lot, that massive green lot I was telling you about where this yeah. is like where we do our formations and everything. And then this is the company area. So yep. then, yep, that's Beatco right there. That's where I would work. All right. Yep. Is that and then this see. is where I'd live right Wait, here. Go, go up a little bit. Could we stay? Is that the exit road going out to the main drag? Yeah, right yeah, here. Go, go, so go up, go up. You want to go then, to yours? Yeah. And then go to the right and then go down this road. All the way, uh, that, that and then be. it's gonna fork and go this way, and then sure? we're uh, gonna be, that get to right too, there. 
Oh, is that is that? Oh, there we go. Hey, all right, there. That's where I was. Uh, yep, I literally told you down group. the street or yeah. this first group. Yeah. You kind of went the back way. That's uh, that's good. You really do know Fort Lewis. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's our five mile route. So we oh, basically okay. would turn around right here or uh, right up here. Okay. Yeah, but yep. if you wanted to go the real way, you'd go here. This is the main road. Yeah, it's the, the main, main road. road. And then you'd hit there. There's a PX. Yeah. You go down here. <laughs> That's where when me and the wife went for our anniversary trip, yep. we went and on boop, there. We're back. That's where we were stopped. <laughs> the, the fence line was like, oh, I don't care. Right I don't here. Really yeah. Up right there. <laughs> yeah. We should have a little gate that you yep. can't have right That's here. A little gate That's there. a yep. little gate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. That's oh, fun. Awesome, man. That's cool. Okay. Good memories. Good times. Good times. All right. So that's the French and Indian War. I agree with you. The last of Mohicans, amazing representation. I mean, not a lot to pick from, but I'm glad the few choices that we do have yes. were well, well made. Yes. All right. Moving on. American War for Independence. Um, yes. A lot of movies made about this. Uh, it's either called the American Revolution, right. the War for Independence. Same, same. Yep. But there's a lot of great pieces here. I know we, you have something I've actually never, never looked into. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I chose a book for this one. Uh, and books still count, folks. They still exist. Okay. They are a thing. It's not all about movies and television and video games. But uh, the book, Washington, A Life by Ron Chernow. And uh, I chose this because Washington's life, he started as an Englishman. You know, he, yeah. he, uh, and it chronicles the book chronicles his entire life from before his birth, his family lineage up to his whole career going into the American Revolution and then afterwards and then ultimately his death. And then talks a little bit about, you know, his legacy after that. So it's a great encapsulation. His life is the thread through which you can kind of see the American War for Independence, because I think a lot a lot of pop culture around the American. Heck, we got uh, I think it's what Assassin's Creed three takes place during the American Revolution. We got Turn, which is a great series uh, about spies during the American Revolution. So a lot has been a lot has been made. And so that's why I chose chose this one. I listened to it on audiobook. It's mm -hmm. like 20 hours long. It's so oh huge. My God. Ron Chernow is good. Is, he's good guy. If you want if you want biographies and uh historical accounts he's he's written a lot of stuff so um watch it do is great i the the thing i like about this book uh if you want a, a sort of review is it shows washington that you know he was not he's not like this saint we have him as like this kind of saintly figure he did everything right and he never made any mistakes but he did he did make mistakes and he had his flaws and and for example you know, you know during the american revolution he wasn't the best tactician but he was super organized and he knew how to hold an army together mm. with a lot of discipline and a lot of structure. And that was one of the most important things about the American revolution was having that army and keeping it together and not letting it fall apart. And it's yeah. just simple stuff like how are you going to get these soldiers paid? How are you going to keep them in the camp? How are you going to keep camp organized? And then also he sure. was, he did seem to be too, totally fearless when it came to being in battle by all yeah. accounts, he was on the front lines. He was running like through the front lines. He'd have horses shot out beneath between him, uh, underneath him, you know, and he he did like to lead from the front when there was a battle. So you can yeah. give him that credit. But then, you know, it just through his presidencies and 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 there's all these details, you know, and working with people and trying to find treat to make treaties and and going back and forth. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I can't help but laugh because I'm not laughing at your explanation, Washington. Like, obviously, he's one of the founding fathers. He's the first yeah. president of our country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just this reminds me of a stand-up. You ever heard of a guy named Shane Gillis? No. <laughs> or it's, uh, it's real. Let's see. Shane. Well, there's the Nate Bargatze uh, yeah. Saturday Night Live Washington skit. That if you don't know that, folks, go and look that up. It's Washington's <laughs> Dream or something like that. That's great. Yeah, no, the comedian Shane Gillis, he's, he's he he cracks me up. He did this one bit. He has a stand up that's available on Netflix right now. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. It's really funny. Uh, but he does this bit about Washington. Like he went to Washington's compound during COVID um, wow. by himself. I think it was by himself or with his Mount with Vernon his girlfriend at the time. Yeah, Mount Vernon. Okay. All right. And he went down there. And obviously, you, like you said at the beginning, you learn like every. 
George Washington is seen as like, you know, the founding father, right? He's yeah. one of the founding fathers, He's the first president of this country. He, he could do no, he, you know, he could do no wrong, you know, chopping down cherry tree, whatever. Yeah, right. Um, but like, yeah, no, he was just like us, right? He had faults, he had yeah. issues. Um, so he, you know, does this bit and like, I, obviously it's drop dead hilarious because it has to do with like slavery and he's <laughs> also a, yeah. he's also a really funny looking guy so when he's wearing his mask all you can see is his eyes and you know the guys probably think he's like there by himself and he's you know has down syndrome so like they're like treating him <laughs> like he's special <laughs> and uh but anyways he's you know they come to the end of the tour and they have washington's teeth on display and yeah. like a lot of people think his teeth are made of wood um but that's not the case <laughs> like washington's teeth and this is one of the things that you're like what the fuck yep. yeah washington's teeth were actually like made of a combination of like human teeth horse teeth cow teeth like the whole nine yards and he would just keep them in his mouth <laughs> and then you know you you mentioned that he was like fearless on the battlefield and in this stand up, it's like, yeah, it's kind of obvious. No shit. He was like, and he was really tall. He was like six foot something. Yeah. And for which, that day, that was when people were not. Oh, that was like a giant. Yeah. Yeah. So could you just imagine this guy, this giant of among men on the other side? Like, imagine you're a, you're a British guy. <laughs> yeah. And you just see this ginormous guy <laughs> coming at you and no wonder he's fearless because he's probably got mercury poisoning from all this <laughs> shit in his mouth and he's just, he's just coming at you foaming from the mouth because like, ah! ah! he's just poisoning himself with his fucking teeth oh yeah it's yeah <laughs> Well, awesome. yeah check out that stand-up it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> okay yeah it's it's a it's a really good bit um but yeah george washington is yeah you know, george washington <laughs> yeah back to washington <laughs> man yeah no oh, wonder he's scaring the shit out of people foaming from the mouth just crossing the delaware him. we're gonna fucking kill him <laughs> <laughs> that's why he won the first presidency nobody would run against yeah him. nobody really wanted to <laughs> tell the guy he lost <laughs> okay yeah. All right, Cameron, that's my, well, my pick. pick. <laughs> well, my pick for American Revolution is it's a pretty easy one. It's the Patriot, you know, there you it's go. classic, classic. I, the reason I picked it as one one of the best representations, just because there's historical relevance. You know, it's based off an event. Um, it's more of a propaganda piece than anything, because. Who doesn't like seeing just this guerrilla military crushing yeah. the British and, you know, at the end, raising the flag up in the battle? Um, you know, it's it's just a, you know, pro-American piece. And it's yeah. I love it. Yeah. And not to mention. It, oh, sorry. Go ahead. That's it, I just going to you right in line with what you're saying. I just wanted to read the tagline from IMDb. Peaceful farmer Benjamin Martin is driven to lead the colonial militia during the American Revolution when a sadistic British officer <laughs> murders his son. <laughs> yeah, it's a pro-American piece, and I love it. Um, it's, uh, you know, it fuels the fire. I feel like there's still some tension going on between America and England. Um, it, it'll never, it'll never, you know, go away. We're like uh, sibling. We're like, you know, like, like love, hate siblings. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, we're always going to give each other a hard time, but hey, yeah. Like we're not going to forget because yeah. the 4th of July is a thing. Yeah. You oh know? yeah. Yeah. We celebrate that shit every year. It's the most anti-British blow... holiday ever. <laughs> yeah. And we literally, we're not going to forget because thousands of people lose fingers every year because of that day. <laughs> um, so like, it's a very important thing to us. Uh, and then, <laughs> yeah, it's just, and then you also have the fact that it's, you know, it's ba loosely based off of Francis Marion, the character who was in the American revolution, mm -hmm. who, you know, basically did exactly what, uh, this character does. I'm what, I'm sorry. Why am I blanking on his name? Um, he's like the Mel Gibson or something. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. He's, he's Francis Marion. They call him the swamp Fox. He was known for you know having his militia do these guerrilla style attacks these you know ambushes and then basically hiding out in the swamps mm -hmm. uh to where they couldn't be tracked or detected so i like the fact that they incorporated those elements and like kind of had 
the uh the inspiration for this character based off of an actual figure yeah and uh yeah and it's part of ranger history too because francis marion was a ranger uh but there you yeah go. yeah that's why that's why i picked that one i think it's uh you know if it's not the patriot it's something very similar for the american revolution but yeah yeah i totally get that yeah man let's move on let's go to i think Right after that, I tried to do these when I was listening. I'm trying to do them in chronological order, but we got the Civil War next. Yeah. Had a ton of video games, books, television, ser- mini series, and movies have been made about the Civil War. And, and one of the, you know, we talk about the parameters. What are the parameters that we're using when you talk about, you know, how you choose the, the top pick for whatever, you know, war representation? Uh, you're going to, you know, you're going to choose. And so it's, uh, it's so much, right. Yeah. And, and you can't, there's the one thing about history that I've learned is that it's complicated. You know, you can't just say, it, you know, it's about this thing and that thing, or, you know, one, one little thing or this person, it's all this person's fault. Like they may have been pivotal, but there was so much that precipitated that came before that. And then a part of it. And then afterwards, which led, which will inevitably lead to other events. But, uh, yeah, the Civil War, ton of stuff have been made about that. A lot of stuff. So I ask you, what did you narrow it down to? Uh, I, I got to go with the like the. Well, I'm sorry. The what obvious did we narrow choice. it down what, to? Yeah, because we agreed on this one. But yeah. glory. glory, 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 movie, glory. Oh man, uh, I, I've seen this movie. There's not too many movies that I've seen more than once, and and yet still touch me in the feels every time. Yeah, uh, I see them. Uh, it's it's just uh, it's so well done. It's based on a true story. It's Robert yeah. Gould Shaw and the 54th uh, Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, I think. And it was a, yeah. it's a colored regiment. It was black black dudes fighting for the North during the Civil War, which was you know a bit, slavery was a big big part of why that war got fought yeah. uh, for so long. It was a split in our country, great uh, a, a pivotal time, I should say, in our country. And just an all-star cast, freaking Denzel. I think he won his Denzel. first Oscar, Oscar for this one. Yeah, yeah Morgan Freeman. Freeman. Yeah, of course. And then a very young and thin Matthew Broderick. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Carrie Elways, too, you know? Uh, yeah. So it just so many. And, and Andre Brower, uh, Rip Andre Brower. Rest in peace, my friend. Uh, also, I forget that he's in there. And then he went on to do, I think it was Brooklyn Nine-Nine after that. Uh, not directly after, but... <laughs> um, uh, but in a very in a very uh, saturated field of pop culture, when it comes to the Civil War, Glory stands alone. Uh, so yeah, true story, great acting, great story. Uh, if I could only show somebody one Civil War movie, it would have to be this one. Yeah, man. Uh, like I said, I or I mean, I haven't said it yet, but we are in agreement that this is an amazing representation. You know, we can't deny the fact that slavery was like <laughs> was. Totally one of the triggers for the, the Civil War, right? It's, yeah, it's the middle, one of the main that. triggers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you can't be like, oh, no, there's other reasons. There was, well, but the this right. was the no, most yeah. important reason. You know? Yeah, exactly. Like the right to continue to have slaves. Yeah, it, to continue it, to have people. And, and that's, uh, yeah. that's one of the things, I mean, like in American history, it, it was already, it was an issue before we were a nation. It was an issue while we were trying to form the Constitution. It was an issue after that. And then eventually it led to the Civil yeah. War, you know? Yeah, I mean... In the history of the world, slavery wasn't a new thing. The United States didn't invent slavery by any yep. means. No, if you've read the Bible, you know that slaves were, you know, they helped <laughs> build the pyramids. Uh, but <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But I mean, it came to an end, you know, here it came to an end. So can we like kind of be like, yo, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, yeah, if you want to, in terms of credit, I, you know, uh, I love America. I think I'll give us credit here in this one in terms of how long we were officially a country until we got rid of a sla- of slavery officially. That's a pretty short time period because, you know, England, I think they got rid of slavery officially before we did, but they had had it for hundreds of years before then. You know, sure. we had it for what, 60, 80 years officially. And then yeah. we uh, then we had had a big old war about it. So, yeah, highly contested issue. Uh, contentious issue. Yeah, but, got uh, it done. Yeah, got it done. Thank got you, it done. Lincoln. Yep. For single-handedly um, ending slavery. There you go. <laughs> um, 
his teeth were made of wood too, apparently. Yeah, right? we want tall presidents. We like our tall presidents. A lot of tall guys. Dude, that's why I, I could never be president. Yeah, I know, man. Yeah. yeah, it's I, yeah. if you look up, I think the shortest president ever was like 5'11 or something. Really? I Four. That's got to be. There's got to be some psychological truth to that in terms of how we view tall people generally. I think I heard once we just project positive traits, leadership traits on to tall people, whether they deserve it or not. They just happen to be born tall. But we we like our tall people. We like somebody to look up to. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it sucks. Let's see. Yeah, I think they're. Oh wait, the shortest James Madison was five four, five. Um, four, but he okay. was also <laughs> he was the super literally genius. as yeah yeah, and he was right at the beginning when like five four was like that's a healthy height. Yeah um, yeah 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 yeah. yeah it's, it's a good fine. pick at the time. Yeah. What did you? Lincoln what do you, was six four. What do you like about Glory Cam? What do I like about Glory? I like yeah. the fact that I think just the message it spreads. I think there is, I think the military has often had a negative connotation about like, you know, groups and everyone thinks like, oh, a lot of the military is, you know, more right leaning. So therefore they, you know, are against pretty much the whole diversity inclusion thing. But I think it just shows you like, it doesn't really matter how tall you are, mm -hmm. how short you are, what color your skin is, your sexual preferences, any of this stuff. When there is a war that needs to be fought, all you can you don't care about what that person does at home. You don't care about, you know, the choices they make. All you care about is if they have your back and if you and if I and, and if I have their back. Yeah. So yeah, you you just put everything you strip everything away and at its core it's a brotherhood. Yep. Um, so like, that's the whole thing that I really love about glory. And that's like the biggest message that can come out of it is like, you have free men that choose to fight against, you know, an atrocity that they see in their eyes alongside other people that, you know, may think differently from them or are differently from them. And it doesn't matter. Like we all are red on the inside. Yeah. 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 No kidding, man. Yeah. It's a great message because even in the midst of this, they talk about, it, they, they showed it in the movie, like, they had pay, pay problems. They had supply problems. And yet uh, these all black regiments throughout history, there's been a couple examples, World War One, World War Two, where these all Korea. black units. Yeah, yeah. will just totally clean house and they'll totally tear it up with fewer resources. Yeah. They're just like so driven, you know, and that and that back during time periods would it's easy to argue that there was like systemic racism and there were laws that were against, them, you know, and and, yeah. and and yet they still stood up. You know, and, and there was one black veteran that says it was because the promissory note of of the Constitution, the promise of the future that we will have all, e you know, all equality and stuff. That's what they're fighting for. You know, for, yeah, for not the, the now. It's yeah, the yeah. Because yeah. obviously it's demonstrable that, yeah, right now yeah, they don't got it. And yet they still stood up and decided yeah. to fight for America. So that that's pretty cool. Um, World War One. Yeah. What's your yeah. pick here, Izzy? I pick, this was a tough one because I feel like in more recent memory, there have been a lot of, there's been this maybe just increase of World War I uh, movies and, and lore or uh, pop culture. And, and so I guess you got to choose what your parameters are when you are deciding, like, you know, if you only got one shot to show somebody something from World War I. And I think I chose, I, the one I chose was uh, like the human cost, right? And and again, it's a personal story, uh, something really kind of intimate. And it's also just well done technically. They did it in one shot. But 1917 was my pick. Yeah. Uh, that came out not not too long ago. And it's from the director, I think, of American Beauty, Sam Mendes. He also did, uh, uh, he also did some Bo James Bond stuff, but... Yeah, it's totally it's it's kind of like that generation. If they're not all gone now, they very soon will be. I think we got a couple 100 plus year olds from the that generation. But uh, yeah, this crazy conflict. World War One was weird because I think it kind of started out light and everyone kind of thought it was going not going to last that long. And then it ended up going on for years and years and years after that. And yeah. everybody just kind of got caught up in it. And then I think the seeds of, of World War II were planted, like I, like you say, in, in uh, World War One. But 1917, great. Sam Mendes, tracking shots meant to be like a one shot the entire time without any cuts. They got a couple in yeah. there, but really technically well done, well acted. 
And, uh, and yeah, so it's, you know, those guys, they got to send that message from one to the other. And they got that great tracking shot at the end where the guy's running to try to tell him to stop the assault and they're already assaulting. So he's like tripping in guys and he's getting back up and he's trying to run into the trenches to stop everything from happening. But, uh, it's cool. It's, it's, it's one of those war movies that inspires you, but it also shows the human cost, which, yeah. which now as obviously we'll, we talk about another ep- another episode, but the evolution of the war movie and how, who, why war movies are made and what the message is that they want to get across and public perception of war movies. I sure. thought this struck a big a good balance. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point, and we will talk about that on a future future episode. There's some <laughs> foreshadowing, not really foreshadowing because we just told you, but um, <laughs> foretelling. Yeah, foretelling, foretelling you. Um, I chose All Quiet on the Western Front, the new um, version. The new version. Um, well, just because, I mean, same message from the old version to the new version. The new version is just cinematically, uh, is beautiful. Um, but it's it's interesting because I like, now I'm reflecting on, I chose, I chose The Patriot for the American Revolution for the reasons that it is a pro-American movie. It is pro, you know, it's pro-war. Like a lot of these movies that are, are the, that are that we're very fond of today are very pro war movies and it it's great cuz i don't know about you i love war i like it <laughs> i like it um there's a place for but everybody I mean, yeah there's a place for everything but i also feel like there's sometimes wars necessary in some situations um like how long are you going to deal with something before you know people take up arms about it so sure. i feel like like the american revolution was a, in my opinion a, a necessary war Mm-hmm. Um, so then, then you have all quiet on the Western front with his, which is ev- anything but a pro war movie. It is its main message. You know, it follows those Prussian soldiers and their life is just hell. Yeah. You know, it's like, nobody would care if they, if they didn't come home. Um, yeah. like, and then not, to, not to mention the sequences of war they go through. I feel like world war one, we started to have these technological advances yeah. uh, in weaponry, but not in personal protective equipment. <laughs> yeah. So basically your death would be absolutely brutal, but there's no real good way to, you know, prevent it from happening. Like now we have helmets, plates, you know, we have yeah. up armored vehicles. NBC equipment. Yeah, like or Seaburn, that's yeah. that's when we like the World War One is when they started using the gas weapons and you know and that I couldn't even imagine that. And have you seen the the pictures of the gas masks from World War One? Yeah, they're pretty pitiful. Oh man, there's no way they're like made of like a can like a waxed canvas that just like there's no way they properly seal. Yeah, um, yeah, it's just you know that that environment is just terrible. And then trench warfare in itself, right. Uh, you're just constantly static. Some guys just, you know, if you make one wrong step, you're dead. People tunneling, trying. The only really way to move was to either completely expose yourself without cover or to tunnel your way through uh, into another person's yeah. trench system. It was just a, a bad, kind of bad time. Yeah, we're and, just feeding, uh, feeding thousands of men into the meat, gr- the meat grinder. On yeah, that one, literally, you know. You know rats don't go hungry like the rats were fat (laughs) yeah (laughs) um so i think all quiet on the western front is one of the best representations of world war one just because like from from a tactic side from a from a humanity side from a technology side it was just an awful war yep yeah we were really even world war ii which we'll talk about next we had we had learned from world war one so there were advances in protective equipment and tactics uh, but, uh, yeah, world war one, was like that first, uh, yeah, that first taste of that true brutality and viciousness yeah. of, uh, of, of warfare and war technology. Yeah. Implementing chemical warfare, the invention of tanks, like, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. That one scene in all quiet on the Western front, when the tanks are advancing and they have like the flamethrowers coming out yeah, of it. Yeah. Yeah. You imagine you're just stuck in your trench and like your little puny bolt action rifle isn't doing a damn thing yeah they were massive man tanks were they they went big in world war one these massively tracked vehicles that could kind of like to get over the trenches and and uh, yeah yeah crazy running over anything and everything yep um but yeah so we that's world war one 
World War II, like you said, we learned a lot. We got a lot of more advances. Uh, yep. But this World War I planted the seed for World War II, obviously. You know, we uh, now it's pretty much we can identify a pretty a pretty evil entity that needs to be taken out. You know, the axis of evil. Right, uh, right. Yeah, we had the Fascist Pacific Front, the Europe. Yeah, we had the yeah. Pacific Front. We had the European Front. And we had a lot of pieces, a lot of historical battles that came out of that. That Some really good pieces of pop culture uh, were inspired from. So I'll start out with my pick, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to say, you know, we already... I don't know how many times we've talked about Saving Private Ryan on this uh, podcast. So I'm not even, everybody knows that's the best World War II movie that's ever been made. Right. Um, so I'm just going to put it off the side and just say that. Okay. Yeah. That's like my some... aliens, you know? Yeah. It just needs to be said. It doesn't need to be said because I've said it so many times. Exactly. Um, so I picked Fury. I rewatched mm. Fury. Um, it's a, an amazing movie. It's, it's so well done. Brad Pitt does such a good job. I'm a big Shia LaBeouf fan as an actor. I, think I like Shia LaBeouf's bit, acting, yeah. Yeah, he's a really good actor. It has a killer cast. Yeah. Uh, Michael Pena, Brad Pitt, Shia LaBeouf, uh, Burn, what's his name? Burn, uh, Joe, or, John Bernthal. John Bernthal, and then the young guy. Um, they're just, they just do such an excellent job of just showing a very seasoned tanker crew that have been through a lot. Yeah. Um, there's, I, I also appreciate the fact that like it incorporates, you know, some storytelling from Africa because, you know, we were, there was a campaign going on in Africa before we even set put foot set put. Yeah. <laughs> put, 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 put. Put. yeah shot put. There was a campaign going on in Africa before we even set foot in Europe uh, and tanks were like the main thing. So I appreciate that, like historical relevance. I mean, Patton, when Patton was like everybody knows General Patton was like the tank guy. Like it was yeah. the famous pictures of him all the ways on the tanks. And, you know, that's what he was. He was in Africa before they sent him to the European theater. Um, so I appreciate the little storytelling there. Mm -hmm. um, the uses of tanks, uh, the uses of tanks, just how they uh, know that they were outgunned from the German tanks. Because yeah, German tanks were more advanced. Were just, yeah, they were way more advanced. The Germans just in general, formidable opponent. Yeah, they got uh, the they got the what is it the the Wehrmacht or the war machine? You know, they I, were pumping yeah. them out. They were getting ready. They were getting ready for war before anybody knew that they were getting ready for war. Yeah, I mean, I feel like they knew they were going to be facing the world. You know. Yeah. Like that's how freaking they prioritized their. That's how they prioritized their assets. Was like we're we know we're going to be at war by ourselves. You know. Yeah or almost by ourselves against the world. So we're going to have to start pumping out some stuff. Um, so like, yeah, they were their Their tanks were faster, more durable than ours. So like we were at a clear disadvantage. Um, but I think just the storytelling of fury, just, you can see like the impact that the war had on the crew, the impact the war had on Brad Pitt's character as the NC as the NCO I C, which is non commissioned officer in charge mm -hmm. of the tank crew. Like that scene where they come back, they've lost a man in the beginning, and they uh, are outfitting, and they told the uh, that that officer, they're like, "We're all." They're like, "Where's the rest of the platoon?" And we're like, "We're all that's left." And uh, he like tells the guys to, you know, he's still building character. He's, and then he goes off to the side and nobody can see him. And then he like breaks down. Yeah. And it's like, dude, that's a very powerful scene. Yeah. Because it's like from a leadership position, you can't let the see. You cannot let the men see you like that. Mm -hmm. You are their example. You are their motivation. You are the influence, right? It's uh, what is the there's that there's an army definition of leadership. It's to provide purpose, motivation to influence here what is that let's see army definition of leadership it's so funny this is fury is one of those examples where it's totally it, it seems anti-war but it's also it pumps you up even if you it see does. these guys they're totally affected and scarred mentally from the things that yeah. they've been through and yet they've molded together into this dysfunctional family and yeah. and you see the the young character get uh logan lerman he gets inoculated inculcated into the life of this of this tank family and he ends up you know getting he ends up getting that infected with that attitude and he's like totally bloodthirsty at the end of it and fighting for the tank to stay alive you know 
Yeah, no, it's it's good. And here it is. The Army ADP, so FM6-22, which is the Army's doctrine on actual leadership. They have like an entire manual. It's the process of influencing people by providing purpose, direction, and motivation uh, to accomplish the mission and improve the organization. So like your role as a leader is to literally be the backbone of this crew. Yep. Um, so if you break down in front of them or you break, so will they. Yeah. Uh, so that's just, it's just for a pick about like World War II. I think it does a great job. It incorporates infantry with the tankers. It shows all the elements. Um, yeah, it's Fury was my pick for World War II. Uh, that's a great pick, man. I mean, I think my, my pick is, is pretty obvious to anyone who's a big fan of World War II, uh, World War II pop culture, of which there is, I think it's probably the most in yeah. our history of World War II pop culture. But Band of Brothers, HBO miniseries, uh, takes the unit from from training all the way through to the end of the war, and uh, so and it and it is a great, it's that brotherhood, right? It's the bonds that you create. It's a little like Fury, only they 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 don't see as much of the dysfunction, you know. Yeah, at least not so overtly, but they are a band of brothers. Yeah, and you got the real guys too. That's one thing I liked about yeah. that many series. They they start each episode with an interview with somebody, and some guys you could tell who they were. They revealed it at the end, but you could tell who they were. Some of you couldn't, so you didn't know which guys you were seeing, and and some characters would die partway through the series. Yeah, uh, but that was my favorite part of it, and some of the true stories that came out of it, uh, like Spears running through town to get communication to the unit on the other side of the town, and the town's filled with Germans. He runs through town. And then he runs back through town again. And the Germans are just like watching him run <laughs> like so confused, like that actually happened. Like, so uh, great, great encapsulation of the brotherhood of war, the bonds that come out of it uh, in a time when, yeah, like you say, we were pretty united about who the bad guys were, and who the good guys were, yeah. you know? Yeah. It was unanimous. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great pick too, man. Band of brothers is just, one of those series like they had the band of brothers they had the pacific and now they have masters of the air is like that steven spielberg tom yeah. hanks triad uh, of yep. world war ii magic yep um so yeah dude i mean, great great picks or yeah good picks let's move on to korea we're running a little low on time we but... are running a little low. we're only up to korea okay let's i know be, see if we can be a little more concise i let's guess let's be concise uh, all right for me I had oh, I was fighting between two. I think I'm just gonna say two really quick, really quickly, because <laughs> one's from American perspective, one's from Korean. I think that's important. Yes, because uh, we haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's an older movie. We've talked about it in our Korean War, uh, Pork Chop Hill. It's portrays uh, American invasion or Korean War, American involvement. They're trying to take this hill, uh, and obviously they're undergun they've tried to do it in the past and it's just really well done for an older movie like the fx and everything are uh are just really well done for the time uh, and then also the front line from 2011 it's from a korean it's a korean movie mm -hmm. uh and i think you know it just does a really good job of coming from an american's perspective comparing how like korean war movies are made Ain't shit's different, you know that's mm -hmm. what i appreciate about it like if you think you're the enemy you're fighting is the same as you uh, yeah. just, they speak a different language and they look a little different. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really cool little, uh, thing that, or at least perspective that I've established watching foreign films about like different wars and different perspectives on it, or at least from their perspective. Uh, yeah. So those are my choices for good Korean war movie. Korean war movie pick is Taegu Ki. I've spoken of it often and very highly. It's a Korean film about the Korean war. The best thing about this film is that it takes what I think is the essence of the Korean war, which was the tearing apart of a country in two, uh, and the separation of, of families and, uh, you know, by, by political and military forces, uh, kind of Korean about kind of being caught in the middle of the geopolitical upheaval at the time, the cold war mm -hmm. really. And it's about two brothers and one ends up fighting for the North and one ends up fighting for the South. And it's just about the kind of tragedy of that, of Korea yeah. kind of being because Korea didn't always be wasn't always north and south. It was Korea. Nope. And now, yeah. you know, and so uh so there's kind of a tragic, sad movie made by Koreans. So uh yeah, really well done. That's my Korean war pick. Okay. Moving on. Vietnam. I'm going Vietnam. to Vietnam War. A lot of picks here. I think yeah. Vietnam is is uh is almost like comparatively speaking to World War Two in the pop culture eyes. Yep. Um but it might the, the the reason I picked mine, which is 
Hamburger Hill. We've talked about it. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, one of the most violent war movies I've ever seen. <laughs> um, the entire movie is a combat sequence. Yeah. What seems like, and it's not just like, you know, we're shooting, we're shooting, we're shooting. It's like, dude, people are exploding like arms and we failed to get up this hill. We come down, we have a little dialogue. We try to go up the hill again, come yes. down, have a little dialogue. And it's yeah. just these, it's the story of American unit trying to take this hill and just suffering massive casualties. But apparently this hill's so worth dying for that they're going to continue to try and take it and try and take it and try and take it. Finally, they take it and then it's useless. And then they're like, okay, we don't need this hill anymore. Yep. Uh, so it's just the combat, I think, in the... You know, the terms of Vietnam, jungle warfare, right up in your face. Uh, that was, it's watching it, I was just like, oh my God. Some war movies are character driven. Some war movies are are storytelling. This was just, this was, <laughs> this was something. <laughs> yeah. That's why I threw it on there. You know, I think there's really good Vietnam war movies like Platoon that mm. more tell a story about character development. Yeah. But I think to just represent war itself, Hamburger Hill was, yeah. Yeah. I got to go super patriotic with mine. We Were Soldiers. It's an earlier Vietnam War film. It's I think it was the first major engagement between the regular American army and the regular Viet Cong, the Vietnamese army. Yeah. Uh, major engagement, true story, and uh, more character driven, I would say. Uh, obviously, uh, pro-American, super patriotic. Uh, Mel Gibson is, he's pretty good at that. He's a pretty proud American. Uh, yeah, he loves America. Yeah. He loves most of Americans. Um, but, uh, we, we were soldiers. Uh, great. Yeah. Um, I love the, it's, it's a true story and you think about them being surrounded and being pushed upon by all sides and they still ended up counterattacking and, and ultimately I think prevailing, but man, with major losses and, uh, and so, uh, that that's my pick for Vietnam. I know there's a lot of stuff you can, it depends on what, what story you want to tell with whatever war you're talking about Vietnam. I feel like in pop culture, it's mostly this kind of down morose, sad, it was useless. It was pointless. And, uh, you know, and, and that's a conversation for another time, but we were soldiers. It's about the brotherhood. It's about these, these guys going over there and fighting for each other. Uh, and I think that that's a good message and it's a, based on a, an actual engagement, which is pretty dramatic if you think about it. So, yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good one, man. So where are we? We're at the cold war. We're Bring at the cold jacket. war. Let's we can do this real quick. Cause the cold war, obviously that's a name for a time period that spans what? 30, 40 years. Yeah. Uh, a couple of decades. Yeah. A couple of decades. And so Not a lot of action, just a lot of espionage, espionage and like, you know, and intrigue. Things, yeah. Yeah. Things going on behind closed doors, a, a hidden war, if you yes. will. Yeah. Um, what, what do you got for a quick pick? My pick is war games, classic eighties movie, uh, with, uh, Matthew Broderick again, very young Matthew Broderick. And it's just about the, in the eighties, it was all about the fear of total annihilation, mutual mass destruction. We all had yeah. nuclear war, nuclear bombs. What are we going to do if we, if they press the button, then we're going to press the button and everyone's going to die kind of stuff. So, yeah. uh, great. That's the kind of core message there. And if you haven't seen it, man, you got to check it out. If you like eighties movies, it's a classic. Yeah. For my pick, I, I went with crimson tide, um, submarines, baby. That was the cold war. Yeah, yeah, I call it the sub war. It's yeah. like, you know, you had all these strategically placed submarines uh, that, you know, could not be identified. Uh, they were in remote locations, but they were strategically placed in order to do precision strikes on Russia, you know? And pretty much you you have you have a you have a group of men, nobody knows where they are, and they just have one objective, and you don't know whether the machine that's giving them their mission is incorrect and their communications are down. And it's just up to these guys yeah. to decide whether to push the button or to wait. And there's an internal struggle between some leadership on the boat or on the sub. And it's just one of those movies that you like, okay, when I imagine the cold war, you think of like espionage and you, I think of submarines because those guys were the ones that were, you know, it wasn't a land. It's not a land invasion during the word for it. This was concerned that we we're going to get, nukes sent at us mm -hmm. um and you know who's going to deliver those nukes the subs mm -hmm. um so uh yeah i chose crimson tide it's a great great movie denzel denzel washington yep and gene uh, hackman yep gene hackman that's uh it's just a real nail nail biter 
of a movie. And I think it just does a really good job of, you know, showing from a perspective of the actual people that were getting action during the Cold War, or nice. at least a story of what we would lead to, like to believe what was happening. Yeah, um, two, uh, two things I'll say about that just real quick before we move on. There's a book called Blind Man's Bluff, which is about just what you're talking about. It's about all the submarine actions that were going on all through the Cold War from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and all into the 80s. Really great if you like war history. And then mm -hmm. there's a there's actually a true story about a Russian guy that almost single-handedly stopped World War III from starting because he got, it was like that, he got an order to launch and he yeah. didn't trust it. And so he went and double, triple checked with his superiors that this is what was going on. They said, no, 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 that was a mistake. And he's like, okay, you know, and, and I, I forget what his name is, but I was like, oh, thank you, random Russian officer who didn't yeah, allow Thank World you War for your service, random Russian guy. All right. That's awesome. Persian Gulf War, uh, the precursor, of, eh, maybe not precursor to Iraq War, but Persian Gulf War, really quick, lightning war, uh, Iraq invades, uh, Kuwait, was it? Yeah. And we go in there and we kick them out. It was real quick. Yep. Super quick, super quick. Best representation, Jarhead. 100%. Jarhead. Yep. Uh, you know, some people have problems with this movie. I think it's one of the most accurate war movies that's ever been depicted yeah. uh, from a soldier perspective. A lot of these more war movies glorify the combat. Um, but in a lot of these wars, so many people didn't see any of that. You know, these are they tell stories of heroism. But what about stories of what about the everyday stories? Yeah. And that's what Jarhead is literally about. You, you train, you're being told you're going to do a specific task. Uh, you know, that's what's on your mind. I love when they're about to invade and they're all sitting, they have the Marine, uh, either their major or whoever's in charge of the battalion is like giving the speech. He's like, you're Marines. You're going to go in there. You're going to kill it. Everything's going to be good. And the end of the movie just comes and it's just like, dude, we didn't do a damn thing. Yep. yep never fired his weapon. Never fired his weapon. Almost did. Yeah. But yep. Dude. <laughs> great. Yeah. Great Jarhead. We talk about it a lot. It's, it's a great movie. Yeah. Iraq war. Uh, the one, the, the one that I was deployed to is not a lot of pop culture. I mean, there's no. some, there's some big names uh, in there. None of which I wanted to pick for this one. My pick for this one is American sniper, just because I, I like the personal story, uh, uh of this guy. And, uh, he, you know, obviously has multiple deployments. Uh, and, uh, so I, I, I liked, I liked that one. Chris Kyle. Yeah. yeah. Life of yeah, Chris, Kyle, Chris Kyle. Bradley Cooper, yeah. great actor. Uh, Clint Eastwood directed it. And so fake baby, fake baby, dude, fake baby. <laughs> oh, watch the movie when they give birth. To uh, the kid. It is literally a fake baby. You can tell it is baby. just a doll. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Well, he's a really good actor. Yeah, I know that baby is an awesome actor. Um, yeah, American Sniper. That's a good pick. Great story about Chris Kyle. Great man. Um, I chose Sandcastle. It's a Netflix original film. Um, it's a little bit of a newer one. It's about 2003 invasion of Iraq, a uh, couple of big army guys. And okay. it just really shows progression of like loss of innocence. Mm. Um, you have a brand new private that shows up and he's on deployment. You know, he just gets to Iraq and he starts and he puts his hand in the door of a Humvee and just slams it on his hand. because uh, he, he wants to go home. He doesn't want to yep. be here. Yep. He's scared. You know, he's afraid of what he might face. And then you kind of just see the progression through events of him starting out as this really innocent young man and by the end of the movie his his eyes you could see in his eyes that something's different and it's funny because the the way the movie starts is exactly how it ends but it's a different person uh, uh, so i think it's good you know there might be it doesn't have that good of ratings but when i watched it i was i was thoroughly happy with it hmm. um yeah there's uh and henry cavill's in it hey. uh, and then also the guy who plays homelander from what is it Jeremy oh, no Star, kidding. Jeffrey Star, no, yeah, that's, Anthony that's Star, a, Anthony Jeffrey Star, I think is a gay man. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the Anthony Star is in it too. Um, so yeah, they got some big name actors in there. I think it's a good a good story. Uh, you got some conventional side, you got some special forces in there. Um, so I like it. Right on, man. Right on. All right. Afghanistan war, uh, so much. Twenty years worth. Uh, a lot of good contenders. I'm just gonna go straight for the beginning which I think is, is, you know, when we had a strong focus, a clear mission, we knew what we wanted to do. We just got attacked in 9-11. In we go into Afghanistan with the Northern Alliance. It's 12 strong. It's special forces. 
Uh, not too many special forces Green Beret movies out there. Uh, I thought this the movie is not the best. I will admit, yeah. uh, but I appreciate that it's a, it's about a, a specific unit, the Green Berets, and what their effect was going into Afghanistan. How they got the Northern Alliance together. How they started pushing back against the Taliban. And and uh, yeah, it was at the beginning before we kind of I don't know just kind of started to decide decide to hang out for twenty years. Yeah, but, uh, right. that's it, man. Twelve strong. Okay, my pick for Afghanistan. Uh, it's easy pick for me. Uh, tells story of an actual Medal of Honor, two Medal of Honor recipients. So it's like mm. you can't go wrong. Mm. And it was made and written by people that actually were at that outpost or at part of that unit. Uh, we're talking about the outpost. Um, yeah, I it's one of my favorite Afghanistan uh, movies just because you know the camaraderie is perfect. Yeah. Everything about the movie, you know, there's a little. Little inaccuracies in there as far as just like, you know, backblast area, just like small things like yeah. that. But as far as the story and the message uh, and the feeling that is communicated through the movie, um, that's it's good. It's yeah. good. Um, but yeah, so the the outpost is a easy pick for Afghanistan war for me. That's a good one, man. I almost changed my answer, but I like that one. Well, that okay. is it, folks. That is our that is our roundup of films that we feel best encapsulate each individual conflict that we were talking about today, kind of just American history. I'm sure you, if you're from another country, or if you like uh, war films about other countries, you let us know uh, in the comments section, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about these picks and what, what other picks would you add into the conversation? Uh, oh, there's too many. I mean, there's obviously like great, not necessarily wars, but conflicts like Black Hawk Down in Somalia, Heartbreak Ridge, which mm -hmm. just told the story of Grenada, Operation Urgent Fury, just with mm -hmm. the wrong unit. They were recon Marines, but the actual ones were Rangers. But yep. it's, yep. But then, uh, and then you have Bosnia behind enemy lines. That's yeah. a good one. Great little action film. Yeah. Yep. And you got, you know, un <laughs> not expected actors playing people. You yeah, know. Owen Wilson, man, his his one oh foray God. into oh, my wow. jet's going down. Oh, Owen. action here! Oh, okay. I'm an American Air Force pilot. Yeah. Oh, wow! Look at all the snow. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you? What are some honorable mentions for you? Real honorable quick? mentions. I mean, listen, Platoon and uh, and uh, like Apocalypse Now, I, I, they're powerful films, but uh, maybe I'm just like a little too patriotic. I think there's a little too much political bias from the filmmakers at the time. They wanted to say something about the war and then also wanted to input their own little political perspective into it, which, Hey, more power to them. I totally support that. I just don't want to watch those films. <laughs> yeah, no. I and then, you. and then war machine, war machine. It's about, it's about that mission drift and how hard it is to get stuff done. It's basically how to, how to run a country, as a military leader, you know what I mean? It, yeah. It's, it's tough. We, it's, uh, the, uh, somebody once said, you know, if you break it, you own it. And we broke Afghanistan and we really, you know, there's a lot, it's a lot that goes into trying to build them up. Asked. Yeah. And then, and then you just kind of leave, you know, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Just pull out real fast and leave cool. a bunch of shit behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Get there, screw it up and then continue to screw up all the way on the way out. Yeah. Um, but okay. <laughs> That's going to do that episode. Let's play our game and then wrap it up here. Right on. All right. So, Izzy, I have the game for you. It's time for an old class. Uh, it's time for an old classic, my friend. Two truths and a lie. I'm going to give you three facts about a war, movie, or TV show, and you tell me if it's true or a lie. Okay. All right. And it's going to be pretty quick. Just got three here, and we're going to start out with MASH. Everybody knows MASH. You know MASH. Ooh, you love I MASH. I do now. So here we go. A. MASH actor Jamie Farr. Actors Jamie Farr and Alana Alda served in the military. B, the series was on for eight years, even though the Korean War only lasted three years, one month, and two days. Uh, and C, the series finale is still the most watched episode of television in American history. That's an easy one. It actually has 11 seasons. Uh, it went on for 11 seasons. I think it would be 11 years, uh, even though the conflict only went for three years. It went for a long time. It was one of the most popular American shows of all time. Wow, yeah, you got that run of the dot. Yep, you identified that lie. The series, the show was on for 11 years. And fun fact, the series finale, being the most watched episode of television in American history, 121.6 million people watched it. Uh, I'm looking forward That's to it. Great. We're in about season seven right now, working our way uh, through it. Oh, watch. still working on it. Yep. All right, so moving on, another great film, Glory, mm. made it on our list. So starting off, A, 
The film's release coincided with the 150th anniversary of the real Battle of Fort Wagner's, uh, which was the battle from the end of the movie. Okay. Um, and B, the Civil War reenactors who took part in the film did so voluntarily without pay. And C, the film won three Academy Awards, including Best Supporting Actor for Denzel Washington. That sounds like B. Uh, I, I'm sure they, they did have Civil War reenactors participate, but they probably paid them. So I'm just going to say B. Ooh, ah. they did not take a dime, allegedly, according to Chris. But the lie is actually the film's release coincided with the 150th anniversary. That is a lie because it was released around the 126th oh. anniversary. Wow, Chris. Wow. <laughs> very, very, very likes to split those hairs, tricky. doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, loves to split the hairs. All right. Well, that's OK, man. Let's see if you can get this last one. So number three, your honorable mention, Platoon. A, the cast spent six weeks in actual boot camp to prepare for the movie. B, to get in the character for the scene where everyone is really high, everyone got really high. And C, Charlie Sheen almost lost out on his role to his brother, Emilio Astavez. Ha, huh, that's interesting. Um, Charlie Sheen, Emilio Astavez. Wait, Charlie Sheen and Emilio Estevez. Are they brothers? I thought he was. Yeah, there. they are brothers. Oh, okay. All right. I'm going to say uh, it's the first one. Six weeks in boot camp because I don't know that anybody spent time in boot camp. But I don't know. I would feel like nobody. There's nothing there that would maybe the boat people had to do some military stuff. But Charlie Sheen was just like winging it. You know? Yeah. No, you're <laughs> right, man. Yeah. The cast did not spend. uh Oh, wait, they spent two weeks in boot camp. Oh, they okay. spent six, but way to go with your gut because, yeah, I feel like Charlie Sheen was just winging it. Yeah, I making a movie in the, the 70s, fact. making yeah. a movie in the 70s, of course they're going to get high. Yeah, I was going to say, I was like, I do appreciate that fact. I also think Willem Dafoe is one of the greatest actors uh, of our generation. All time. Um, so I was like, of course he's going to get super high if he needs to be. Um, <laughs> yeah, but that's it, man. Good job. Way to finish strong. That's going to do it for the game. Oh, by the way, let me correct myself. Uh, I was thinking when we were talking about Platoon, I was still thinking of Apocalypse Now. So I was oh, okay. like, oh, I was well, Martin Sheen. But it's Emilio West and Charlie Sheen. Of course, they're brothers. Of course, they're brothers. Okay. Hey, you don't got to explain anything to me, man. You're always writing my book. <laughs> but folks, that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks for bearing with us. Went a little bit longer than we usually do, but that's okay. We just hey. want to make sure that you get everything out of this podcast that you possibly can make sure to tune in next week for another episode if you've made it to the end we want to make sure that you guys know that our youtube we are coming out with new content like going back to our gameology roots izzy and i are doing video game reactions for you thanks for all the support you see you guys seem to really be loving those videos uh because yeah they're doing great so thank yeah. you we're gonna plan on doing more for you check out our merchandise if our pay if the patreon sounds good to you and if it does sound good to you it's probably because you want a little bit more out of this podcast you want some extra content you want a little bit more needy greedy out of izzy and i that's probably going to be the best bet to get that so check that out and if i don't if izzy doesn't have anything all i have is key music <laughs>